We've already reviewed the RX 5700 XT reference card, the Sapphire Pulse model that we received as a front runner for board partners, and the MSI Evoque OC, which was overall poor value when compared to the cheaper solutions on the market. Now we're looking at the Gigabyte Gaming OC card, the first triple axial fan contender in our RX 5700 series benchmarks. It all comes down to thermals and noise with these, as gaming performance is functionally the same between each card when stock, and so we'll focus down on if Gigabyte can achieve competitive thermals at equivalent noise to the Sapphire and MSI cards. At $420 MSRP, the Gigabyte Gaming OC is priced around where the Pulse is and just below the Evoque. So today we'll be looking at Gigabyte's RX 5700 XT Gaming OC to see how the value is. Before that, this video is brought to you by Corsair's Hydro X Water Cooling Series. Corsair Strength is bringing water cooling to the masses, and it has built out cooling solutions with industry leaders to help newcomers get into open loop cooling. Corsair has fittings, adapters, GP water blocks, CPU water blocks, pump res combos, and radiators all available in the HydroX line. As you can see in our footage, these kits can be used to build beautiful open loop systems. Learn more at the link in the description below. So this is Gigabyte's version of the 5700 XT. As mentioned, we're in territory now where we're basically just looking at the thermals and the acoustics because just like the NVIDIA cards when we've looked at those in the past, there's a few that stand out as special, like Canepan or HOF cards where you're looking at extreme overclocking support. But these cards that are meant for just normal use, they really differentiate themselves in how effectively do they cool, do they do anything really stupid in the physical design of the card, how are the acoustics, and that's kind of it. And then maybe you factor in the value proposition. Gaming performance, to give you a reminder if you didn't see it, the Pulse and the Evoque were maximally about 2% different. And the Evoque has a higher frequency, uh, it holds a bit higher frame rate in games, but that was kind of a difference. And ultimately we, we ruled that it wasn't worth the 2% because it's so thermally challenged in other ways. So uh, with the Pulse about the same as the reference card, but better in all quality of life aspects, just the same in gaming performance, with the MSI Evoque, roughly the same as Reference and the Pulse, there is no reason to continue testing gaming. The frequency on this is the same as the frequency on the Pulse. Ergo, the performance will be the same. So, uh, thermals and noise are where it's at for this, and ultimately that's what you need to pay attention to once you're comparing card versus card, because you've already made the decision, if you're here, probably that you want a 5700 XT, so it's just a matter of which one. And other than maybe some really extreme models, don't expect anything gaming performance wise. We'll talk about the, uh, the cooler, I guess we'll, the cooler efficacy today. We have a teardown of the card that's going to be going up separately. If you'd like to see how it's assembled, it's really easy to take apart. There are no warranty void of removed stickers on it, so Gigabyte, good job. And uh, it's four screws plus three more for the uh, heatsink fan mounting through the backplate through the PCB for support, that's it. And you'll see that in the teardown. Let's get into the numbers. We'll go through thermals, noise, and that'll be it. Noise normalized thermals are up first. We use these tests to configure all coolers to a noise level of approximately 40 dBA when measured at 20 inches and in a room with a noise floor of 26 dB. This allows us to normalize for fan speed between the GPU coolers and eliminate the ability of a cooler to jump to the top of the charts simply by way of having faster fans. At this noise level, the Gigabyte RX 5700 XT ends up with the lowest edge temperature by far, but a junction temperature roughly tied with the Sapphire Pulse at equivalent noise levels. This opens up an interesting discussion, as edge temperature is no longer used as a boosting gauge, or at least not the primary one, it becomes significantly less relevant as compared to junction temperature, which is used for determining GPU boosting behavior and power throttling. Further, because edge temperature is a sensor at the literal edge of the die, it's possible that slight cooler differences could have a bigger impact on this result without meaningfully impacting the junction temperature, which is the maximum out of all of the uh, sensors on the die. Junction measures the hottest of all the sensors. Radeon 7, for reference, had 64 of them, and it reports that number, so we get a clearer picture of weak points on the card. With regard to the metric that really matters, then, Gigabyte's gaming OC falls right in line with the Sapphire Pulse. They're within margin of error for junction temperature and not distant from our modified MSI Evoque with increased mounting pressure. As for unmodified cards, Sapphire and Gigabyte are neck and neck here with the Gigabyte card holding an advantage for edge temperature. 
That said, given how much variance we've seen in edge temperature just by remounting a cooler, we're not convinced this metric is meaningful. Junction, again, is what we really care about. Thermals for GDDR6 on the boards positioned the Gigabyte card at the top of the results with the G6 temperature measuring at 74.7 degrees Celsius while noise normalized to 40 dBA, accounting for ambient, which is logs actively. This puts Gigabyte about five degrees lower than the next closest, which is MSI's Evoke after we modified the cooler with area appropriate thermal pads and more mounting pressure. The next stock card is the Sapphire Pulse at 82 degrees Celsius, still well within reasonable operating temperature, and then the significantly louder AMD reference design when left alone and unmanaged at 51 dBA. MSI's unmodified Evoke lands at the bottom of this list, resultant of thermal pads approximately 40% of the total necessary size and also poor mounting pressure. Thus, poor overall cooler to pad contact and limited pad to module contact. GDDR and VRM components only need to be within reasonable operating range. Ultimately, it's not like GPU temperatures where lower temperature gives you more boosting headroom and significantly less power leakage. It's, it means a lot less than that with G6 memory. And overclock in G6 memory is more limited by Navi in this instance than by thermals of the modules. Gigabyte gets points for a technical victory here. We just want to emphasize that it's in territory where the gains aren't necessarily meaningful beyond what's already achievable on the modified evoke or the unmodified pulse, for example. VRM thermals aren't perfectly comparable as card-to-card -card MOSFET differences eliminate our ability to draw linear comparisons, but we still get to see that Gigabyte's card keeps the VRM thermals well below the rated temperatures, which, depending on the, mod the MOSFET you're looking at, are typically between 115 degrees to 150 degrees Celsius. In our upcoming teardown of the Gigabyte card, you'll see that the memory temperatures are advantaged as a result of direct airflow coming down and hitting the memory cold plate. The memory isn't buried beneath plates and heat sinks, which can work well, and so in this instance, the air gets down to it, and that benefits Gigabyte in the listings. Plotting frequency with stock settings, fully stock, no changes, and running 3D Mark Firestrike Extreme, the Gigabyte card ends up running at about 1885 to 1930 MHz, with an average frequency closer to 1915 MHz. The total range isn't that different from Sapphire's Pulse card with the default VBIOS, just a bit more stable in terms of amplitude from top to bottom. MSI's Evoke has a higher sustained clock attributable to its 2% gaming uplift on average, though this could be achieved with a light OC on any card and demonstrates a relatively flat frequency in this chart. This next chart shows the fan speed versus GPU temperature for Gigabyte's card, allowing us to better understand how the fan curve works on the gaming OC. While the card remains roughly at 69 degrees Celsius edge temperature, the fan typically rests around 1700 RPM. We see some occasional spikes up toward its maximum speed, which is over 4000 RPM, but these are rare. We're also unsure of how accurate those spiked readings are, because there's a lot of inaccuracy in AMD's fan readings specifically, uh, which we may talk about more separately. But we might have to use our RPM gun on this one if it becomes suspicious, but for now, the average fan speed is below the 2000 RPM mark that we use for 40 dBA noise normalized testing, so you could bring the fan speed up on the card while remaining reasonably quiet. This one runs warmer when fully stocked than the others because it also runs the fans less aggressively, and that with three fans that are smaller is necessary to deal with the noise anyway. Running at stock settings, now looking at the uh, the non-modified fan curve, just fully stock again, no manipulation of the default fan speed. We exit direct noise level comparisons between the coolers, but allow for an out-of-box use case analysis. So we get the out-of-the-box thermals. The Gigabyte RX 5700 XT runs a GPU edge temperature target of about 66 degrees Celsius, the same as the MSI Evoco C when left stock. This is the target to which the fans will adjust to meet the uh, with GPU temperature, as shown in our previous fan speed chart. The Gigabyte card's junction temperature ends up higher than the 40 dBA test, as fan speeds are lower with the card fully stock, so it's plotting about 90 degrees here. That puts Gigabyte as warmer than the Pulse and MSI cards when left to manage their own speeds. And as for memory and VRM temperatures, Gigabyte maintains the strongest GDDR6 memory temperature performance of the pack, almost entirely thanks to the direct airflow down to the memory, and the VRM thermals are also acceptable. So conclusions, we did technically do the gaming tests. We did, I think we have uh, three resolutions across four or five different games. So it was a good amount of tests, but 
uh, we're not going to put the charts on the screen because there's no point. They're all the same. The Gigabyte card, we did test it for gaming, but uh, the Gigabyte card is functionally the same in gaming performance, meaning within error of the pulse. That's all there is to it. You don't, don't even worry about gaming performance with these, at least the ones we've reviewed, because they're all basically equivalent, except the Evoke, which is a bit higher frequency and a bit faster, but that's just the only advantage it has. Uh, OC, overclocking is limited by GPU silicon more than anything else with these types of cards. So one to the next, there's no real difference in how well A card overclocks versus B card out of the ones on the table, because they're going to be limited by silicon and to some extent the cooler, not by like PCB configuration. As much as we obviously do like to see good PCB designs, uh, that doesn't start factoring in heavily until you really start pushing the clocks with better cooling solutions like water at the very least, if not LN2. So thermally, the Gigabyte card is extremely competitive. It does really well for, v for memory thermals. It's actually chart topping for those when noise normalized. It is reasonably quiet with a default fan curve versus the temperature target. It runs a actually a quieter fan speed at about 16, 1700 RPM versus our 2000 RPM to hit 40 dBA. So it's below 40 dBA at, with, uh, with our noise measurement methodology. And, uh, and that makes it really competitive to the point where if you're picking between these two cards, basically what you're picking between is first price, whichever one's cheaper, no other constraints in your buying process, whichever one's cheaper, buy that one. And then the uh, second factor to look at is size. So Sapphire's card ends up a bit shorter, which will make it fit horizontally in some of the shorter cases a bit better. Whereas Gigabyte's card, and when I say short, I mean this way, whereas Gigabyte's card is not quite as vertically tall uh, because it does use a standard PCIe slot height for the card. So that gives you better fitment in some smaller cases uh, in terms of where the glass is on the case. Or ITX cases where you have extra room for the length of the card, but not for the height. So that's really your de deciding factors for these. And then the final one, I suppose, is availability, because we all know that they're still pretty limited right now. Gigabyte is making one to two shipments of these cards per week out to retailers, at least in the US. And you'll have to be fast to pick them up, go to your local stores if you can. You'll have to line up in the morning and get it. Uh, 5700 XTs are still pretty Pretty hard to find in stock right now, but that will change eventually. Uh, so those are your three deciding factors. Overclocking is once again not really worth exploring card to card. We've done it, we've overclocked them all, but the PCB is not changing anything. It's just, it's entire luck of the draw on the GPU uh, up until you get it to more extreme stuff. So pricing, the Gigabyte card is supposed to be about $420. The Sapphire card was supposed to be 410. We haven't been able to catch it in stock yet, so we're not sure of the actual resting price of it. But when we've seen it on Amazon listed on back order, at least initially, it was 420. So if they're equal in price, you you have those other three uh, other two factors to pick between, and um, definitely better than the reference card for either of these two. Can't go wrong if you're considering that, unless for liquid. And MSI is not really in the equation right now. Too expensive, doesn't justify its price with the PCB, doesn't justify its price with the cooler, and 2% performance just from boosting the frequency has no real monetary value that at least that, that they're trying to pull out of it. So that's it for this one. Gigabyte's done reasonably well here. It's very competitive with the Pulse, and uh, it's more or less a tie between them other than the aspects already mentioned. So no massive complaints for this one. Thank you for watching. You can go to store.gamersaccess.net to help us out directly doing content like this. We'd suggest picking up one of our GN toolkits or the mod mat like I work on on the table here. You'll see that in the teardown video. Or you can go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus. And we'll see you all next time.